Hello, my name is Norman Charbonneau. I'm the ICAVP program and one of Kelly's friends. Um, are we friends? Yeah. No, it depends. It, it, <laughs> When I talk, we're not friends. When she talks, we become friends for some strange reason. Because I'm, I'm the big bad Canadian guy. But first, I would like to acknowledge that we, the land we meet on today is the traditional lands of the Karna people, and that we respect their spiritual relationship with their country. We also acknowledge the Karna people as the traditional custodian of the Adelaide region. Sorry, and that their cultural and heritage beliefs are still as important to the living Corona people today as well as I hope for us. About Kemi. My dear Kemi, I'm speaking to you now. I'm not speaking to them. The, f the first time I've heard you speak in public, in a conference, I had some sort of an epiphany. It doesn't happen to me that often, because I then understood the intricate relation, relation between your culture, your spirituality, your nation, your language, and your relation with nature, Mother Earth, or like Indigenous Saint Canada, Turtle Island. It was a discovery because of you, of, the, of a complete knowledge system before that meeting, my occidental mindset was creating subsystems instead of seeing it as a whole. It is not because I haven't read about indigenous matters, because I didn't have relations with indigenous people, because I had that opportunity all my life. It is because nobody spoke with such an eloquence and such intelligence about those links between those elements of your indigenous knowledge system. I understood now that the whole is a lot more important than the subsystems that I had in mind. You are a militant for your nation. Your culture, librarianship, she's not perfect. Construction of bridges between communities, and you are an inspiration for many, for me. So, it's your turn, my dear. Come and share with us. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I would like to say that I am honored uh, deeply to be here today and I'm actually shocked that so many people are in the room at 8 o'clock in the morning after such a lovely evening last night. Um, my name is Camille Collis and I come from the Teltan Nation which is located in northern BC and I don't know where the clicker is. Oh, there it is. Okay, I'm not used to such high-tech um, uh, kind of thing. So I have a picture up on the screen that shows um, uh, shows where my nation is from in relation to uh, British Columbia and Vancouver. So if you can imagine um, North America, and then if you go to Vancouver, British Columbia, where we had um, uh, the 2010 Olympics, um, you will see, you'll drive about another 28 hours north to get up into Teltan territory. So we're located in the corner of, um, of northern BC, the Yukon, and Alaska, where the people of the Stikin River. I'm honored today to be here on, on Gorby territory. Thank you. I was really worried about saying that properly uh, because it doesn't sound like it looks on the page. So I'm very honored to be here today. And I need to pay um, homage to my, uh, the university where I work at, at the University of uh, Manitoba, which is in the heart of Turtle Island. So for those of you that don't know, Turtle Island is, in North, is North America. And there's some maps that actually will show how that is. Now remembering that we called that Turtle Island a long, long time before there was um, aerial photographs to be able to show that. In my territory, um, 
we actually say that it's like, and if you can, you can see the beak is in, is in the Yukon, and our tail feathers are actually in Wrangell, Alaska, and so it's like a raven with the wings wrapped up. So these are things that we knew a long time before there was uh, modern technology like there is today. And I'm honored to be here in a, in a, a land that is uh, one of the oldest in the world. And really, I think that um, in my territory, we always talk about the fact that we survived the last glaciation at a place called Shesley, where my father, uh, Dempsey Collison, uh, was born. His, his indigenous name is Klishta, which means father of daughters, and there's three of us girls. So I have um, a younger sister, Candace, and an older sister, um, Cynthia. And I'm very proud of the fact that we've been able to work very hard to be able to um, educate people and to create awareness in all of the fields that we have. Norman called me an, a librarian. I actually wouldn't call myself that. I'm more of a cultural memory activist. I started off in, um, in anthropology. Actually, I started off wanting to go as be an accountant. And um, I look like one, right? Anyway, and, um, and I took a couple of anthropology courses at UBC. I went back to school when my son was 11 and I was 30. Uh, to do my undergraduate way back in the dark ages of 1990s, and um, and uh, and actually, it's very interesting uh, to think about the technology that we used back in those days uh, to be able to um, work with our knowledge. And I um, took a couple of anthropology courses, and very quickly I changed to anthropology. So I actually started off in that field, learning about archaeology and museumology. And I met this incredible lady, uh, Dr. Jean Joseph, who um, was the title librarian and archivist for Delgamut. And for those of you who don't know, Delgamut was a pivotal case in um, the Canadian legal history. And she organized all of the evidence uh, for Delgamut and all of the oral traditions. And that is when the courts acknowledged that our oral histories um, were actually legal evidence. And so she uh, decided I organized this big event, because I'm quite good at organizing events, apparently. And I organized this big event in, uh, to help uh, with three other people. My older sister was in law school, and she volunteered me that I had to do it. And so I um, helped with that, and uh, we organized um, a fundraiser for uh, WeWa Library, which is at the uh, at U University of British Columbia. Uh, and uh, located by the First Nations House of Learning there. And Jean's like, who is this Camille? Who is this Camille? So I met her, and she said to me, I want you to work with me. And I said, oh, I, I don't think I can, because, you know, contrary to popular belief, we don't get free education as Indigenous people. And I had a student loan, and she said, uh, no, I'm going to fill out all the paperwork, and you can work for me 10 hours a week. Well, that was my first introduction to library and archives, even though I'd spent half of my um, uh, school education in a library or an archive hiding in there reading. Uh, but I um, ended up working there, and one of the things that I, I discovered when I was there was um, an Indigenous classification system by the name of Brian Deere, who's um, uh, Haudenosaunee, or sorry, uh, Ganawaki Library, and from Montreal, uh, and um, I had developed an Indigenous classification system when I had worked for uh, Aboriginal Fisheries, and it was almost identical. And so, therefore, that's what really pulled me into um, the classification of knowledge. I'm actually doing my PhD in anthropology, um, and that's why I say that we, um, I don't really call myself a librarian, I don't call myself an archivist, and I don't call myself an anthropologist. We really work with um, knowledge in a much different way uh, as Indigenous people than mainstream. We didn't separate out our, our knowledge into libraries or archives or museums, those are Western constructs. Our knowledge sits in our land, and our knowledge sits in our history, and our wisdom sits in our land. And we say uh, that knowing our history and who we are informs our present, present and gives us direction for the future. In this picture, um, there is um, a picture of uh, what's called Tuskia Chokima. So first of all, I come from the Tuskia clan, and you see that on my uh, purse that my cousin Yuna Ann made for me. And so that means crow. 
and uh, we have two clowns. Uh, we're matrilineal people, so we follow our mother, and we like to tease our neighbors who are more patrilineal, that you always know who your mom is, so we know uh, what clan we come from. And um, I think that uh, part of that is that I'm very lucky to hold both um, a name, which means Estada in, my, in our language that I was given by the late um, uh, Liz Edzurza, who you see up in the, in the uh, left-hand corner there that I'm leaning over. And uh, she gave me the name Estada, which means that I fly around crazy, like trying to share our traditional knowledge and to preserve it. I was very, very lucky uh, to grow up as um, an outfitter's daughter going out on the land and knowing our land. And you can see a picture there of our pack train and me with my horse and our Teltan bear dog. And a picture of me on the Stikin Grand Canyon. It's Canada's Grand Canyon and the second largest in North America. Coming back to the um, Teskia Chokima, it literally is translated as Teskia, which is, um, uh, is crow, but Teskia Cho would be raven and Kima means house. And within that uh, structure there at the confluence of the Teltan and Stikine River is where we say creation happened. And you can see on the relief that there's wings on that canyon. And if you want to um, uh, Google Teltan, you'll be able to look at more pictures of that. Within that, there's a highway up there, which is supposed to be a highway, but it's really like 30% grades gravel road um, that we keep and that we've traveled. Many of the trails in northern um, uh, Canada, and especially in Teltan country, follow along Teltan trails. We were very fortunate enough to um, have one of the uh, largest territories um, in British Columbia, 111th of the province of British Columbia. And we actually had our own uh, territory at one point called the Stikine Territory until there was a minor gold rush and then we had Confederation in Canada. Uh, but knowing that we have lived there continuously for over 50,000 years is a very important and crucial point, but this is where the beginning of the Teltan Nation happened at this confluence. And that rock in the middle that you see there is called the Dew, and uh, where the confluence, where the Sikine and the, and, um, the Teltan rivers meet, uh, it forms a mist, and in that mist there's a rainbow, and that rainbow is... Um, called Kadidiklitz, and that's my grandma's name. So my grandma is Ethel Kwok. And her younger brother always told us, the late um, uh, Robert Kwok, that we belong to our land. We belong to our stories. No matter where I go, I wear my clan. And I remember one of my Niska girlfriends, who are our southern neighbors, said, how do you know who's Teltan? And I said, oh, I don't know. I guess, you know, because we're tall and tanned and good looking and, you know, whatever. And she goes, no, because you tell us and you tell us and you tell us. Anyway, um, and I think that that's really important for us, that we're very proud of who we are. Uh, but remembering that we went through a colonial era. My dad is a residential school survivor. Um, if you're, um, if you're um, in the session, you might hear our, our um, senior archivist, Raymond Frogner, talk about the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. And um, that was really created out of a lot of work from many people. I think that I encourage people to go to that because it is our legacy. It's a dark legacy of Canada, remembering that uh, when apartheid was created, it was created because they came and had a visit to Canada. So I've actually been around the world and talked to people about Canada's legacy with Indigenous people. And I've actually had some people uh, say to me, that's not true, that's not true. Can Canada isn't like that. Canada is like that. I'm very proud to be a Canadian, but we have to acknowledge the history and we have to tell the truth. I stand here today in a red dress because I want to honor Canada's murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls, of which at the last count that I looked at, there was over 4,000. We have more children in care today with ch child and family services that have been taken from their families than we ever did in residential school. It's continuing today, and we need to change that. And part of our job um, as archivists and social activists is to be able to make a difference and to tell the truth about that legacy and to be able to create change. And us even doing the truth-telling and, and 
opening up our records and archival records to that to people to be able to have access to do that research is super important for us to do and it helps us to be able to empower indigenous people and i know this is the same for many countries that come from a colonial legacy whether there was colonization done by many things and i'm not all indigenous um, i'm irish and i'm english and i'm dutch and so i'm not and my ancestors aren't innocent either but I think that it's um, important for us to recognize and to change that and to create a better future for next generations. If we don't come together and create and, and recognize that we're all human beings and that it's just skin pigment and culture that separates us, we won't leave a good legacy for our children. And this era of climate change, it's super important for us to come together and to create that commonality between our countries globally so that we can uh, actually have a future for our children. So I'm very lucky that um, I, I always feel that I'm very lucky that I come from the Teltan Nation. I also hold a name in the, um, e in the Niska Eagle Clan, so Luxki Clan. Uh, my dad is Chiona, so we have two clans. We are Dene people who intermarried with the Clinket people for peace. So we're button blanket people, and you'll see a picture there in our regalia. It's not a costume. It's not a Halloween costume. It actually is our regalia. And there we are, there in October 10th, um, 2010, and we're celebrating 100 years of the Teltan Declaration. So our greatest chief, Nana Kwaka, was my great-great-grandfather. Um, he uh, decided we have never ceded or surrendered our, our land at the cost of our own blood, and we will never do that. So we created a declaration, and it went to the BC government, the Canadian government, and to the, and to the king at that time in England. I think that that's very important for us to recognize that sovereignty of Indigenous people and to empower Indigenous people to move forward. I think I'm going to uh, move on to this slide, on to the next slide. I want to encourage you that work in cultural memory institutions to remember that you are super important in the reclamation of our history and that transfer of knowledge. In, in a time in Canada, there was uh, what we called the potlatch ban, and until 1951, we weren't allowed to practice our traditions. We weren't allowed to pass things down. We weren't allowed to, we call them feasts, but they call them potlatches in the southern coast, and people weren't allowed to uh, do sun dances, which is some of our ways of transferring our knowledge intergenerationally to the next, to the next generation. Because of that, many of our, our intangible and intangible uh, histories were taken, they were recorded, because apparently we were supposed to be um, a vanishing race while I still stand here today despite all of those things. And I always say, but for the grace of the Creator, um, you know, I could have been one of those murdered and missing women. I, my community lives along the Highway of Tears. And I'm very fortunate that I've had many people in my life that have been able to um, encourage me. And education was the vehicle for me uh, to be able to have a better life, and that's how I was taught, which I believe that many people here obviously uh, felt the same thing. But remembering that we need to understand Indigenous people's sense of view or sense of um, uh, worldview, and that when you hold those items in your in your archives and uh, you don't allow access to it, it's a very painful thing. I remember standing at the um, uh, a national archival conference. And um, because of our rules and the way that we do accession and who owns that knowledge, um, sometimes in the past, people didn't have access to those records. And I had an archivist um, start to cry and say to me, you know what, I feel so bad because people came down to access their residential school records. She worked at one of the church archives and I didn't allow her, them to access those records and that person passed away. So for us in Canada, there was something that really needed to happen, which was the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And we need to w work with communities to, re to um, uh, re empower them and to breathe life back into our archives. So for things, I think for me at the University of Manitoba, I took the position there 
and I didn't know why I moved outside of my province. I w I've never even thought of moving outside of BC or the Yukon before I took that position. But they say you go to the heart of Turtle Island for healing, and I believe that that's what happened. And about eight years ago, I couldn't speak in public. Uh, even 10 years ago, I couldn't even got up here and said my name. Uh, but eight years ago, the elders at the University of Manitoba said, you have to start sharing because there's not very many of you there. And so Gary Robson and Florence Painter, I see Dana and I feel very at home here in Adelaide because we have people here that are from, that I've, I've known for a long time. And thank you for welcoming me here. But I think that that was one of the things. And so we decided that we would um, bring the International Indigenous Librarians Forum uh, to Winnipeg. And that gathering for me was a pivotal force. I have to say that in 2004, when I graduated from my master's in both library and archives, I, um, I moved back home to my own community. And I said, my nation first, I want to work with my people first. And I did a digitization project before that was even kind of big. And, and I was trying to pull together our knowledge. And I got an, I, somebody told me about the International Indigenous Librarians Forum and that it was going to be in Regina in 2005. And I went down there and I thought I was the only one because you often feel like that when you're working in your own community and you're isolated. And I was the heritage manager, so I was not only doing um, archives, I was also doing our archival permitting system and, and going out in the field and doing archival work and uh, working with traditional uh, youth studies and with um, uh, working with our GIS uh, specialists to be able to uh, coordinate it because our knowledge is not separated out that way. It's intrinsically connected. It's like a spider web and it all is relational to each other. So you have to remember that when you ask people about their indigenous knowledge that there's going to be a long story and somebody goes to me, oh, just say it really fast. I'm like, you can't. There's many, many different threads and pieces that we have to pull together. And um, so for me, that was really important that we did that. We had an elder-led um, conference. Um, I was really fortunate enough to go over in 2009 for my community, um, uh, and now I'm just not probably going to say it right, uh, to Ataki, and uh, now I just lost it, in New Zealand, and I'm sorry I didn't say the right name. Um, but I think that uh, that was a really pivotal force for me because I was able to meet other people, indigenous people doing that work and I was able to learn from them and to be encouraged by them. And I met many people who um, fundamentally changed my life and encouraged me to do many, many things. I, um, I'm really honored that Ariana gave me um, a green stone to be able to wear and I wear that when I'm traveling. And I think it's really important that we acknowledge people who've given us those gifts. I continually wear Tel Tan Law. We're only allowed to marry the opposite clan, so I wear wolf and crow on my wrist, and you'll see me usually have this bracelet on as well. If you, um, if you didn't obey Tel Tan Law, uh, you were put out of the community, and part of that was so that we kept our kinship systems very pure and we didn't intermarry too closely. I look at that and I think, you know, um, one of the things that we need to remember is that we had our own laws and governance before there was colonization and that they were very important for us to follow. And when you go into a community, you need to create those relationships to be able to learn that because you're not always going to be able to hear people come and talk to you like this and, and give you um, a keynote about uh, the things that we need to do. And I don't see a clock here, so I don't want to go over time. So I'll get Norman to, yeah, thank you. So I think that that was a time of change. In that same year, um, so that was a time of change for us in libraries, archives, and museums in Canada. People came, we gathered together, and the wonderful thing was we met each other. There was many people I didn't even know from across the country uh, that were Indigenous and our non-Indigenous allies, or I call them co-conspirators. Um, to be able to work with us and uh, to preserve our knowledge. At that time, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission finished its work and published its report after doing a number of national events. Many, many Canadians didn't even know that residential school had occurred in our country. And some of them did know, but didn't realize what it was about, that children were forcibly apprehended from their, ch from their families, put into residential school. My dad went to two residential schools in the Yukon. 
Um, they were strapped if they spoke their language. Many were abused physically, sexually, and they were about uh, killing the Indian in the child. And so I think that that was a really important thing. So part of when I got to the University of Manitoba, I was able to work on that bid and we were able to um, ask them to bring their archives to the University of Manitoba. Simultaneously, the Canadian Library Association um, was no longer fiscally viable and we created a, what we call the Canadian Federation of Library Associations modeled after IFLA. And because I was um, in a small population province, I ended up being president of that library association and I helped to found that and we ended up with a seat at the table. I'm gonna fast forward, but you're all gonna be able to have this uh, slide at the end. Part of what they asked me to do was to answer what those 94 calls to actions were from the TRC. And we formed a group of 45 people from across Canada. And we had Elder Norman Mead and a, no and a number of other people to be able to advise us. There's a critical need for us to create a community of practice. I believe there's a critical need for us to create a community of practice globally with Indigenous people. And we're gonna see that happen tomorrow at the Indigenous Summit. So I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, we had, we, what we did was we created a, a, a report on the truth and reconciliation and we answered those calls to action. We did it in a way that was holistic because our knowledge is um, interconnected with each other and we looked at a number of different things, whether it was decolonizing libraries in space or classification or naming. Uh, we looked at a number of different things about that. And we had a number of different teams. We had Indigenous and non-Indigenous co-leads to be able to do that. These are the 45 amazing people. We had three months to be able to do this work. And we came up with 10 overarching principles. So the ones that I think that are um, the most important is that we created a community, which we call the Indigenous Matters Community. Uh, we modeled that after IFLA, and I recently became the chair of IFLA Indigenous Matters section at, uh, um, at, uh, in, in Athens in uh, the end of August. And uh, one of the things that we did is we created a holistic uh, wheel, and we asked um, archivists and other people that work in memory and in museums and in language to come and join us. So this is kind of where we did. We had 27 uh, working groups that have worked on a number of things. Um, some of them have done reports. It was a year of Indigenous languages this year. So a hub came out for that to, to enable people to work with UNESCO. Um, there was the Indigenous ontology that we put out on Indigenous Peoples Day. We created a national hub. Another thing that we did is we talked about copyright and there's a number of different things that I'm just gonna scroll through. Um, <clears throat> but remembering that the languages are very important because enfolded in them, is our wisdom. And you can't access some of that worldview by using English. So when I talk about Tiskia Chokima, uh, what happened with that is that people started to call it Eagle Rock because of the uh, relief, the wings on that, on Tiskia Chokima, which is not what it means. Tiskia Cho is ravens and Kim is house, so it's actually our raven would, we would be the same as God or creator. And so we say that that's where we would um, come, and we come there every year to be able to go back when the salmon is running in the river. And I think that part of that is really important because um, if you access it in English, you won't be able to understand that that's our creation story, that that's where we go and we acknowledge that the creator created our lands. So I think that part of that is decolonizing our... our um, our libraries, our archives within our languages, having wayfaring signs that are gonna be in our languages, uh, working with the community where our libraries and archives and cultural memory institutions are established. The other thing is to recognize um, that we wanna be able to um, enhance the pedagogy for our communities to integrate indigenous knowledge into the curriculum. We want to be able to acknowledge that Indigenous people own their own living language, their living traditional knowledges, their ancient knowledge that they come from the land. And so we need to, make, we need to implement the um, United Nations Indigenous Peoples, uh, sorry, UNDRIP, and we need to be able to, as I just slipped the slide, slide too soon, um, we need to be able to implement that so we acknowledge that Indigenous people own their own 
knowledges and that we ask them for permission and it has to be about culturally appropriate access to those knowledges. So there's a lot that actually is in here and I'm going to close off with this slide uh, that talks about relationships. We need to create relationships with Indigenous people where we're on their land, of who we have holdings with and uh, those that are in our communities because I think that that's the most important thing. Without that relationship we are not able to access um, the no Indigenous knowledge in a culturally appropriate manner. We need to have respect for that. Our governments need to implement that in our laws and our legislation. And without that relationship, we don't have the right to be able to access that Indigenous knowledge. And even if we have it in our holdings, sometimes there's knowledge that's too sacred to be able to know. And sometimes there's knowledge that's gendered knowledge. It might be women's knowledge or men's knowledge. And we need to acknowledge that and work with Indigenous communities. So if there's anything that you can take from today from my keynote, it's about creating relationships. I often say I'm like that real estate person uh, that says location, 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 but I say relationship, relationship, relationship. Create those relationships. That's what we've done in Canada to be able to create a better uh, way forward. And I encourage you to do that here and in your own countries to create relationships to move forward to the next generation. Because without that, we won't continue. We believe that Indigenous knowledge may have the secret to cure many of our diseases that we face today. And it may even have the answers to things like climate change. I want to say madu, which is thank you in my language, or madu cho. Huge thank you, and I raise my hands to you. Thank you for being here today. So we have five minutes for a few questions. So if somebody wants to ask a question, a question to uh, Camille. <laughs> Julia? Hello, Camille. Um, just thank you very much for the generous sharing of your background and history. Has there been a receptiveness by, on the behalf of uh, Canadian archivists and librarians to the work that's being done, do you think? Is it taking time or is it goodwill there? Well, uh, we, um, we announced it on February 1st and we actually were still, because we had just had ILF, we were um, holding and caretaking the Maury Stone, uh, which is the um, symbol for the International Indigenous Librarians Forum. And that includes archivists and people working in cultural memory uh, that are Indigenous from across the world. So we actually had that when we talked about it, and I think that all that movement happened during that time. It was incredibly well received. It was endorsed across the country uh, from every association, including the archivists. And, um, and it was actually a shock how much people were receptive. And I always say that I, I kind of banged my head against the wall for 10 years trying to uh, do advocacy and create awareness in Canada about some of these issues. And then the Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, happened and delivered their report and all of a sudden it became, everything became about, oh, we want more Indigenous people, we want Indigenous speakers, we want this, we want that. Uh, I have to say before that, that what, that was not the case, uh, but now it's definitely been well received. Uh, we have a Truth and Reconciliation um, uh, Task Force that both Raymond and I sit on, and Reagan, I think she talked yesterday, I don't see her uh, today, that we talk, uh, that we, we all sit on to be able to create change for archives, and that's because one of the calls to action is directly to archives. And so we're working on trying to um, create a report for archivists to be able to implement in Canada. Uh, we've had many examples from around the world, whether it's here in Australia or the Maori people, uh, the Native American protocols, which of course we endorsed as well um, in um, our writing, because I think it's really important for us to share that across our countries and to learn from each other and not to recreate the wheels. One, a last question, one more question. Proskovias Vag is my name mixed with an university. Um, thank you, Camille, for your very interesting presentation. I base my question on the work that Trudy Peterson uh, has done on truth commissions, and I would like to acknowledge that work. But I would like to hear more on um, 
how uh, the TRC in, in Canada has managed to diffuse uh, its findings to the benefit of those that it has documented. How have you? How are you sort of uh, using this knowledge to create awareness among the subjects of the operation? So I can't speak for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission because I wasn't part of it. And um, uh, but I will say that part of the reason is is because they did these national events across the country, uh, and it was survivors that came forward with their testimonies and were willing to share. And the, part, the reason why they did that was because they never wanted it to be forgotten and they were willing to do that. I think that that's a better question for Raymond and I believe that he's going to be speaking in the next session um, so he can answer that question for you. But I will say that the, our Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, who's still our Prime Minister now, uh, today, so uh, he actually, um, he said that the government would be implementing those calls to action we haven't seen them all be implemented. We haven't seen UNDRIP yet be implemented, but we're hoping for that change. So it, it was our last question, and thank you again, Kimmy. You did great as well. <laughs>